So for you, what would be marketing? Marketing is uh, about identifying and meeting like human and social needs. Um, you just meet needs in a profitable sense. And you just, it's a process of creating, communicating and delivering and exchanging offerings for that brings value to customers and society at large. Yeah, that's very good. Lots of, lots of different concepts that you bring in your definition. I really love it. This is wonderful. So you bring the, the concept of exchange, you bring the concept of value. I, I, said, I think you said the, the word need. So um, bringing up needs that brings value to the consumers and society. Yes. So what is value, you know? How would you define value? Wouldn't the value be like, like a service or a product? Well, the value will be what you get from this product. Does it value depend on the person as well? Like how much the person values um, or thinks that the object or thing is worth? Yes. Value is not something that is universal. Value is very individual. Could it be or, like utility, like usefulness? So utility is a value, exactly. So utility is usually based on some performance that is expected what, of the product. Or what benefits, I guess, uh, X product brings to the consumer? Yes, the benefits. So um, value is therefore has to do with the perceived benefits that you gain from a product. And the expenses, the costs that you are giving away for this product. Excellent. So actually I have this slide here, so I'm just gonna jump to it. Value is therefore a combination of two things, what you gain and what you lose. So you gain the benefits from the, from the functionality of the product, the utility someone mentioned, but there is a, a product is, um, is a generic term for multiple things, such as a good, so it's a physical product, like a car, like a phone, like a computer, like furniture, a service, something that is not physical, but is, is provided at the same time as it's consumed, such as an haircut, um, a Uber transportation, or an organization can be also consumed. So um, CSUN is an organization. Um, the army is an organization. Then you can also consume a location. So people buy uh, real estate, people go on vacation. So there's a, an image which is different between California, Washington as a location, Hawaii, Mexico. Then you can also consume an ID. Don't drink and drive. Um, you can also consume a person. So it's like the difference between Biden as a president or Trump as a president or Ariana Grande as a singer and Nicki Minaj as a singer. So all of these are products. That's the overall name, but more specifically, a person, an ID, an organization, a location, a service, a good, okay? And all of these have benefits. And all of these have also service value, which is the, 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 the intangible uh, benefits from consuming something. So there's an intangible after sales services when you uh, buy a car. And that's also part of the value. So maybe there is more value to buy um, a Ford than there is uh, to buy a Subaru because Fords have um, more dealership and so you get more services. Then there's a personal value, which is there is the fact that you know the people. When you go buy from them, you know the people versus you don't know them. All these people are more trained to answer your question. They're more experts 
uh, more available to answer, answer your question. You go somewhere and there's only one person helping for six days, 10. So the, this personal value is very important. And then there, there's the reputation, the, the brand image, the, uh, the brand equity. So all of this is the total customer value, which is divided by the cost of buying the product, by the time it takes maybe um, in order to um, access to the product by the effort it requires in order to understand the product. So some products are self-explanatory and some products require more knowledge, uh, more training in order to be consumed. Um, maybe one as a, as, a, as a simple leaflet in order to understand how to use the product versus another one as a large manual in order to use the product. So they both perform similarly, but one is more complex to learn. And then there's the psychic cost, the cost that you have in thinking that this is right or this is wrong. Um, maybe there's a cultural element uh, that has a, has a cost because, you know, maybe it was uh, produced by, um, uh, within a context that you're not, you're not sure this was a fair uh, and no one has been exploited in consuming this product. So the psychic cost maybe to consume something that has a sort of negative stigma in your society. So what you get minus how much it costs you to get it is the value. Value and satisfaction are not the same. Satisfaction is measured after you consume. So when you're about to buy something, you're looking on Amazon to buy something, you're looking on eBay, you're looking on the internet to buy something. You can't imagine the satisfaction. You can only get a sort of imagine the satisfaction and that's the expected performance. The per perceived performance is actually what you got. Um, therefore, satisfaction is a difference between what you expected to get and what you actually received. The Value is a difference between what you see that you are getting and how much it costs you and all the different costs associated with this, uh, this expense. So there is a difference between, therefore, satisfaction and value in the sense that value is, can be measured prior to or at the time of, of purchase, prior or at the time of purchase, versus satisfaction can only be measured after purchase at the time of consumption. They're both very important because people buy product on what they, uh, they see and what they evaluate. And what's very important with value is like someone was mentioning, there's no such a thing as universal value, but it's always a question of perceived value. Okay. So as a marketer, you have to develop products which will have a good perceived value. So for example, oftentimes the packaging is very important because the packaging doesn't help much with the satisfaction because oftentimes it's discarded and oftentimes it does not have a, a large impact on the uh, performance of the product. Um, Sometimes the packaging is, is really uh, what makes it satisfying as well. I get it. But I'm just using a general standard. Most of the time, the packaging is really what generates this perceived value, you know, making the things looking more expensive, bigger, um, more uh, eye hand. And people buy with their eyes first and what they judge from what they see. And, um, and it's very important to understand that. And then after this, you'd be lying if it was such a perceived value that they bought it, but then it doesn't perform as anything uh, that uh, compared to what was anticipated. And then you lose the client because you lose trust to buy again and, and buy in the future. So, Marketing is therefore the delivery of customer satisfaction. 
So oftentimes students will say marketing is about selling more. Marketing is about building a brand. Marketing is about creating products. Marketing is about advertising. All of this is correct. All of these are functions of marketing. And uh, you can't really say there's one more important than the other. They're all necessary. But the simple two line, one and a half line definition of marketing is it's about satisfying customer satisfaction. And not only that, it's about the delivery of the customer satisfaction. And it's to do it at long term and for profit. So I see Jacob has a question. So let me answer this question first. Yeah, you said marketing is basically the delivery of satisfaction to the customer. But I know that there are some name brands like Starbucks or you know other brands that aren't necessarily better. At, like your opportunity cost would be better. Um, like a lot of people say they don't like the coffee at Starbucks. But yes, their marketing yeah. tactic is is such to an effect that everyone goes to Starbucks constantly. So in that sense, is that still delivering satisfaction, even though you could be getting better value somewhere else? Well, here's what happened is the the you know, like if you take um, if you take McDonald's, and I'll I'll talk about Starbucks just right after. But McDonald's is about 40 million people that eat at McDonald's per day. It's the biggest restaurant, the largest supplier of fast food in the world, 40 million. It's the uh, population of Spain every day that eat at McDonald's. Um, personally, food is, a very, is very important in my life. So um, if I think about eating, um, I, I don't equate this with McDonald's. And so I was sort of um, surprised when I had my my first kid and my second kid, how much my kids wanted to go to McDonald's because they felt this was a reward. And because I didn't want to be coercive, in other words, I didn't want to beat up my kids when they made the mistakes, because when they made the mistakes, I took them to McDonald's. I said, okay, you lied, you did something wrong, you didn't do what you were supposed to do. Sorry, you're going to go eat at McDonald's. So for them, they don't equate McDonald's with good food because when you are actually someone that care for good food, you would not, uh, I, in my personal opinion is you would not end up um, at McDonald's. And I could, I could see that, that my kids uh, know when they think about having dinner tonight, uh, McDonald's is, will never be in the top thousand uh, places they would want to go because we use this as a punishment. Uh, for uh, them to uh, to do something else, and it worked very well. I didn't have to do it many times. And so, however, if you are in a situation of rush and uh, you want to eat, and uh, you have five minutes, and you know what you're getting, um, I think McDonald's is is acceptable because it's 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 food and it's going to do the purpose of making you uh, not hungry anymore. But if I have a choice, this is not where I would want to go. So now, using the same example, I've not done Starbucks with my kids. If they're bad, I take them to Starbucks but, um, because it's coffee. So I, um, Starbucks is, is the same. It's not uh, someone that loves coffee. At least now, it might have been very different um, at the beginning when they were in uh, Seattle and they had one, two, three um, coffee uh, store because they were using a uh, very advanced technique and selective coffee and so forth. But if you're looking for a coffee that is convenient and that is, for most people, I would say it's, it's acceptable, you probably end up at Starbucks. But again, you would, the choice of ending at Starbucks for uh, it, is really the convenience and it's also the fact that people that will end up at Starbucks as a choice are people that don't know about great coffee because people that really care about great coffee they will end up somewhere else but they will also go through the effort of looking for the other places so 
everyone has different interests and therefore everyone has different ranking of what's quality. And therefore, if we had all the, uh, the perfect compass of what's the best product for every category, um, a day would not be uh, 24 hours, it would have to be 60 hours in order to be able to constantly look for all the best things. So there is different people with different needs. And some people, when they buy a car, they only buy transportation. They have no interest in uh, driving and all this. It's just transportation. So when some people eat, sometimes they, their only interest is to not be hungry. And there's no interest in the nutritional value and the, um, the sourcing of the product and the flavors and, um, and all that. So all of this knowledge that you have has an impact on how you look at the world and what you perceive as being maybe closer to the truth, even though maybe there's no exact pure truth about what's a good product. You know, there's a big difference between expert point of view and consumer point of view, because the experts oftentimes know better than the consumers, but as the experts become more and more experts, their point of view become more isolated at the same time, and they're sort of lacking the, um, the common man sense in looking at an evaluation, so a long explanation, but I think it's a very important explanation because the world that we live in is definitely controlled by marketing. And marketing is about either used in order to fight for a product that is definitely better than the other one. And it's trying to use marketing in order to reveal what's better and what's more important for people to be informed and then accept the, the value, or at least the true value that people should be looking at, or marketing is used in order to sort of um, exploit people. And usually products that are sold uh, for the masses are usually the common denominator product. And therefore using oftentimes marketing in order to simplify the transaction. Any example of what's a better coffee than Starbucks? Coffee beans good. Bill's coffee. Yes. Seattle's best. Yes. So all the one you're mentioning right now, I think are better, yet they are not as good in marketing. If I had to recommend you, what's more important, having the best product or having the best marketing? It depends. It depends how successful you want to be. If you want to be extremely successful, marketing will be more important. If you want, you have less ambition, the, the, the quality of the product will be more important. So marketing is always more powerful. Your understanding of marketing. Yes, Crystal. Um, question for Starbucks. Um, wouldn't Starbucks be considered, because I know there's a study that's been done uh, recently that they're more of a service um, than a drink company, as in that their main focus is providing you with service, like the barmistas take your name and et cetera. Would that have to do with, yes. in the sense how they market everything? Yes, exactly. It's it's more service than a product because it's the convenience. I mean, if you say. Like you them asking meet... for your name, um, them starting to getting to know you if you go to the same one every day. Um, it's more of that aspect than just them making coffee for you. Hus well, there's more hospitality involved, right? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to get at. Well, but if you go to the, to the same coffee every day, that should not be just Starbucks. They should know your name. Well, yeah, at that certain point, but they would, they might write your name and they might put something like "Have a great day," um, things like that that enhance a service more than what is expected. Service uh, and experience. Yes, but what happened is Starbucks is con constantly collecting data on people' experience, and they're collecting that from all the different places, so they know. At a, with so much data, what to say to make it better. And so they're, they're focusing on what's the best location. They have a, someone 
who specialize in GPS location and finding the right path of where we should have the store and how much a million dollar we can expect per week in that store area if it was there versus if it was there. So they must mm -hmm. more focus on all the, uh, the scientific analysis and how to improve this business. Uh, the different flavors, how many things you should have on the menu, how many is too many and how many is too few. Um, it, they, there's no details that have not been looked at with, uh, by, by an accountant. You know, everything is, is, is super measured. If you take someone who's just doing coffee and that's all they do and they only have one store, uh, they're going to focus on the coffee and uh, I try to have the best coffee and maybe win by having a coffee that you can't find in other places, like you mentioned about Phil's coffee. But there may be some other places where they just have a coffee That's store cool. because they don't know what else to do. And they have this coffee store there and they just live day by day. And they don't understand the concept of developing a relationship with customers. They don't understand the concept of understanding what they want, what they don't want. They don't understand yes. the issue that they saw the competitors and maybe there's prices. Um, maybe one day they think of doing something, then the next week they try something else, but they don't see what they did the previous week, if it was better and what was better and what was not so good. You see, there's a lot of businesses that think marketing is about doing things. Marketing is not just about doing, but it's about doing things and then measuring the impact of those things in order to make the next decision. So collecting information, but also analyzing this information is also part of marketing. So statistics is an extremely important element and embracing statistics, fully embracing statistics is very important in marketing because statistics is not just to sound scientific, but it's also to optimize your decision with some level of um, assurance, right? So if you run a Starbucks, you don't try to, to set a record for the best coffee in the world as it will be rated by the experts of the coffee. If you run a Starbucks, is you try to increase satisfaction for the convenience of the location, of the price, of the flavor, of the of the choices and also uh, for the experience to be always uh, sort of standardized so you want to standardize as much as possible so people can go from one starbucks to another and they get the same experience it doesn't have to be amazing it just has to be right for what people expect to get from that location So it's very measured, it's very quantitative. It's very, you know, run, run by someone who has a, a accounting um, inclination and it works very closely between the marketer and the accountant versus a mom and pop coffee store. It's more of a day-to-day -day, um, relationship and they don't have the, they don't understand, fully understand what's marketing and they don't have the resources to fully de deploy marketing. And that's why it's kind of sad because you have a lot of our world that is sort of becoming franchise. Everything is becoming a franchise because everything is sort of becoming standardized because marketing is sort of dictating how to run this. So you have management, finance, accounting, marketing, and they understand how to optimize all of that. And then it's sort of less individualized and becomes the corporation taking over and people become either they go with the corporation or they become, they go against and against it's more and more difficult, mostly in big cities. Any comments? Yes, Dylan. I think that's a really good point that about your remark that a lot of franchise development has kind of overtaken um, one of the kind of the 
key practices of of at least marketing here on the west coast of Los of Los Angeles and in California, Seattle, United States, and the like. Um, I think with that is that a lot of the times, I remember taking this uh, this this one uh, business class uh, when I was in community, and while there, they talked about how a lot of times small businesses, in order to help be able to even get the business launched off of the ground, usually a person has to have a very solid plan uh, of some sort to be able to kind of say, to, to go to a bank and then to be able to say, here's a business plan and we studied this market, here's what we would do with this amount of resources and, and how we would be able to best use the financing to be able to turn a profit and eventually pay off the loan. And I think that's a really good point is because a lot of small businesses, you know, people think that they're gonna save up their own money and then just spend their own money. When in fact, that might be one of the worst decisions ever because spending one's own money, okay, they lose it all. <laughs> and yeah, and then they and then they completely crash and and uh, and I think that happens a lot of times today. And and a great cafe that I think almost that is different from the norm and is yet to become kind of consolidated into a franchise is this one place called uh, Earth Cafe, and it's kind yeah. of close to Santa Monica. And uh, and I think they really do well, kind of setting a unique brand, but also kind of appealing to eco-friendliness, but also still also kind of an uplifting uh, community that has health conscious cuisine that's, and organic coffees or something. Yeah, this is, that's why things are never over because I remember make, doing a lot of projects with students and we were saying, you know, hey, it's not possible um, to get into the business with um, a new car. Cars is out of touch. And here came Tesla. And they, yeah. it, it's impossible to come with a new soda because there's Coca-Cola and Pepsi. And here came Red Bull. You know, so it's it's not true to, to say that everything has been done and everything is blocked. And it's, so it's very important to understand that there is markets that are more competitive where, you know, you can't come up with a, a great opportunity every day. Um, and there's some markets where it's easier to come up with one a week, maybe. And, but it's very important to have this understanding that therefore there's it's still the wild west when it comes to business, but it's, uh, it's an understanding of the, the difficulty, the level of difficulty in order to break. And I would say more important than that is the timing of when you thinking of doing your break. There's different timing and sometimes you could be in the wrong timing and some, or sometimes you could be in the right timing. And there's a, that's where maybe I would say there's a little element of, of luck that needs to, to be in process. So, and if I had to say this element of luck, um, I would say that's like 5% maximum. Most of the time, luck is 1%. Luck is only really appearing as strong when you have actually done some kind of anticipation of the luck that you may have. So, what I'm trying to say is that if you do some research, you find some conjectures, some changes. And based on these changes, you sort of try your luck in those areas. And then one day you find that you get lucky because you were sort of planting seeds in an area where you could be more lucky because there was more changes that happening. So <laughs> again, you know, that's why this semester is an interesting project because we're talking about shoes. And to me, the, the biggest change in shoes in terms of design in the past five years is I would say it's a nostalgia design. What I mean by nostalgia design is um, I see people wearing shoes. You know, I'm born in the 70s. 
I see okay. people wearing shoes now that wear the shoes I was wearing in the 70s. And when those shoes became out of fashion, so we're talking like the early 80s, it was almost inconceivable to be wearing them unless you wanted to be really marked as a weirdo to be wearing those shoes. Versus now I see it's almost like if you really want to make an impression with shoes, is you really need to find that shoe that is a, a, a revival of, of, a, of a very iconic model from the 70s or the 80s. And then you have a designer that will do almost nothing on the shoe because you don't want to change the shoe because it's so iconic and so good. But just a, a, a small, the, the tiniest detail change that you will do on that shoe from the, the most um, iconic person. My, my daughter showed me someone yesterday on Instagram that had millions of views. And he was a young actor with an Hispanic name who I never heard before. And he she told me, oh, this uh, Hispanic name actor, everybody love him right now. And he, everything he touches, it, it, it's making millions of dollars. Never heard that actor. He started a few years ago, and they probably, if they haven't done it already, they're going to take a shoe and he's going to put just a small little difference and they're going to call it Pietro or whatever his name was. And or anyway, I know they have like a designer from that artist. From that artist. That endorses so, the franchise, right? Yeah. So, they, so then yeah. I think that's like the trend in the shoes. So telling you, Adidas, that's what you got to do. You and Nike, that's what you got to do. So for them, it's it's kind of cool because that's their, we're talking about their shoe for the most part. So they go back to those Puma and Slazinger and whatever Adidas shoes from 78, 72. And then they take a designer, a hip hop person, a singer, a boxer, some kind of icon. And then you, you add 1% change on the shoe and then you on the box you create a box with a lot of gold and you put their name and the shoe is slightly modified you make sure it's 50 percent more expensive at least in it has cases. their emblem their signature yeah a little emblem yeah. maybe on the on the sole or whatever similarly enough um h&m also did something like that and they had uh i think they went to some prestigious locale and then and then they had a soft opening where it was almost yeah. they throw an event or gala yes, where everyone gets to the store and gets to see kind of the yes that's what and, you do and yeah and so but why am i using this example because you're doing the shoe and so you are in this kind of situation where it's not trying to say what shoe are we going to do so you know it's like nike one nike two nike three nike four nike six nike twenty and so what's the difference between Nike 20 and Nike 1? Well, the, the sole is, is thicker, has more bubbles. You become a point that adding more bubble to the sole, people are not that stupid. It starts making no sense. So then you say, yeah, but our bubble before we're round. Now they're square. Now our bubble are octagonal. We can have more bubble per square inch. Then uh, the bubble are uh, have a special gas inside, you know, and it keeps on going and going. And then you, you just run out of ideas and people just can see it's a gimmick. So then you go back to nostalgia. But then you have to kind of face the people as you told them, you know, why are they trying to sell a Nike 5 more expensive than a Nike 20? When in fact, we know the 5, they told us when they did the 6, that it was horrible. And that's how they could sell the, the 6 is because by telling us the 5 was useless now they're revising the five so then you start realizing this is limited all editions <laughs> limited edition of something that was supposed to be not as good as the new one and so now they have to to, to use marketing in order to to make us swallow the pill now when it comes to grounded shoes that's new that's that's a, 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 a disruption it's a big disruption so then the, the situation you're in, okay, so it's a disruption. Why don't we do a Nike grounded? Yeah, but that, that's 
that's not what I'm asking you. So again, you know, I had meetings today with students and that's why I told you last week, I'm not surprised everybody's thinking that this project is about... They think it's about the shoe. They think the it's shoe about itself. the shoe. Yeah. And it's not about the shoe. It's not about the shoe. Right. Yeah, it's not about the shoe. The project is not about the brand. It's not about, oh, this project is about to find um, a brand that would work. Uh, it's not like I have a list of brands that would work. And if you find the list I have in my head, you get A. And if you find a list that I don't have in my head, you get F. The project is about finding opportunities that once combined together makes a lot of sense. So I use an example I used today meeting students. If you find there's more and more pregnant women, and if you find that the big change within this pregnant woman is they are more inclined to use more and more um, health products, health products like vitamin and minerals and yoga uh, classes and going to re relax center and they buy the relax at and the, the energy band and the, all the kind of things. You find that. So then you go, you know what? Why don't we make a shoe specifically for women? And then we, we will sell it to, um, to a brand that is very much growing brand within the, 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 the lifestyle of, of educated, wealthy women that are looking for this. So maybe it's, unfortunately, I don't know an example of a, of a brand for this, but let's say it's called Baby Gap or whatever. And, so, and then you do a Baby Gap because they're making shoes for women the baby gap shoe that would have the grounded thing. And it would be part of this capturing the energy for the pregnant woman so she gets as much energy as possible. And then her, her baby will also benefit from the energy that she would get and all this. Personally, let's say I have a, I have a wife who's pregnant and I'm in the store and there's the normal shoe with a big thick sole with a lot of bubble. And then the shoe which are grounded and they're capturing the energy, whatever. I don't care what, I buy the shoe with the energy. Hoping it works, you know? And, and so I yeah. think, and so that's what I would say. And then I would, so it's, it's more important that you find the combination of the concepts, the, 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 the changes in the environment, that you can make a star, story out of it. And then the brand that would fit that story and that you would use will come very naturally to you because it, there would be not too, too many. But coming and saying, you know, Nike should do it and they should do it with some hiking shoes. Yeah, fine. But that's not what we're looking for. That's too easy. Or saying that um, Patagonia, should, since they are outdoor shoes and the people of Patagonia, they like relaxation and the vibes and the earth and a lot of them believe in energy and all this and being good with the environment and sustainability that's a little bit better than my nike story but i mean i'm worried there's 30 groups out of 32 that are going to do that and therefore you're all right. competing for the same piece of land it's a good yeah story. all 32 folks are marketing for nike essentially that leaves i mean then there would be a there wouldn't be as much opportunity that yeah. be. and yeah, so similarly to, enough yeah. with this with the storytelling is that essentially all 32 groups are telling the same story over and over again when yeah. there's so many different other stories out there exactly. and you know just like with the pregnant woman the pregnant woman could be the hero of that story but yeah, if yeah. if every time it's you know if every time those stories are about nike 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 then it gets limited oftentimes, yeah. sure. Yeah, yes. Nike uh, hiking shoes, it's a natural, I mean, I, I thought of it after two minutes. I don't think I'm a genius. Is it, can you still write a good paper on that? I suppose, but it, it, this assignment is not due next week. That's what I'm saying. So don't jump to the easy, because if, I just be more creative, you have, several months to do that. So don't start doing your research in November, but if you start doing it now, you will find a combination of something that is sort of 
samples as good as the Nike, if not better, because you find some changes in the environment that would be directing with the logic, with a good sense, the good common sense, that that story stands. And it's like, wow, brilliant. You made your own story. You understand marketing. You understand uh, storytelling and, and conjectures and research. And that's what I'm trying to teach you because then you can apply it to any project. Anything can be done. And that's why there's so many students that rave about what I'm trying to teach after this class is because they go and work in the industry and they go, wow, I'm actually doing right now what I was doing with that professor at CSUN. Yes, because you end up in the markets that you have to, to create the next best thing. And the next best thing, so listen, because now I'm going to confuse the, a lot, all you, is the next best thing to be successful. If it's too complicated, it's also unlikely. So you want, I mean, the Nike things for the hiking, it's not complicated. Is it like to work? Very likely. I think Nike can make anything work in addition. But almost everything. And then the pregnant woman, that could work. But don't make it too complicated. It is what works in business often time are simple things. If it's too complicated, it takes too much money to, for people to understand. It can't be too intellectual. Uh, it can't be too much of a stretch. Also, you can't think of something that is too niche, too small. You know, it's like uh, for pregnant lady who are over 50 years old. It's like, I think it exists. I think it's possible. But then why would you limit that? Oh, because they are the one with the most money. They are the one that care the most about their health. I get it. It's too limited. So you need, so then you're going to say, so what's the- right, It's an anomalous kind of situation. Yeah. Yeah. It's an anomaly. So you have to, you have to make sense. So it's, it's sometimes the students, they say, it's funny, this class reminded me of business law or whatever, because you have to make your case. You have to come up with a set of arguments that once put together makes your case sound really strong. And so that's what you do. And if you don't believe me, you need to watch a program called Shark Tank. I believe you. Yeah. it. No, <laughs> but I'm saying this for maybe for other, other students. Is you, you go on Google Shark yeah. Tank TV program and you listen to the first three, three minutes of a Shark Tank presentation. And that's what they do. They explain the opportunities they identified that allow them to believe that this product is missing. But once this product is coming into life, all of these people are going to want it. And you need the shark in order to help you bring it to market because they have the network and you don't have the network. You don't have the money. You don't have the network. They have the money in the network. You have the great idea which is supported by those wonderful opportunities that are solid and like sourced evidence. It's not you pull that out of a hat. And once put together in that package story with the sample that you have in your hand and they take it to the shark, they look at it and they go, you're right. Oh, I could use that. Done. I give you this much. That's Shark Tank, that's all it is. But then you need to talk about how much does it cost to make this product? How much do you need in order to make people hear about it? See it, try it right? And all of that, then there's a return on investment. And then the shark thinks about that. If I give you 50,000, what do I expect to get? A million? 100,000? 10 million? And obviously it likes the 10 million with 50,000 investments, right? So this class is sort of should help you because of the mindset of when you actually look at the shark program, not only enjoy more the shark, but sort of suddenly understand the language that is going on in a Shark Tank program. So marketing is about delivering, so that's a process, satisfaction to customers for long, a long time, So which means that you could do, you're not focusing on short time because it's, you, sometimes you don't try to get, to make a lot from your customers the f one time. Is you, you try to make money from repetition. So what's better to make $500 from one person or to make 
uh, $50 every time you meet them and satisfy them and they come back. Because this $500, you may have made too much money. $50 is you repeat and then they become satisfied and then they tell other people of their satisfaction and then they become an advocate for you. And that also has a, has a benefit for you because it's, you reduce your marketing. And in fact, what's interesting is the best marketing is the marketing others can do for you. They are more, more powerful marketing, the word of mouth, um, less expensive. And in fact, the best marketing is the marketing that will decrease the amount of marketing that you're gonna have to use in order to, to sell the product. So it's kind of sado masochist, if you want. It's like you are, are into marketing in order to make so good that you are less needed. The worst marketing is, in when, is when you have to go and keep pushing everyone to sell your product, pushing everyone to buy your pr product. The best marketing is when, it's, when you are less and less needed, right? For example, I, I, um, I hate to do that, but I have to do it. Is that I launch a new product in Las Vegas and then they ask me to come and do a speech. When I come, they all get excited about me, my sales reps and all that. They all know I'm coming, I'm the priority. Then I do the speech, they all energize. Then for one or two days, they work very hard. And then the third, the fourth, the, the week after, it goes down. So then they expect me to come back. And if I have to come back all the time in order to push them, that's one city. There's so many cities in America. There's so many cities in the world. Can I be everywhere? No. That's bad marketing. So now I'm working more and more for not showing up everywhere. Because I tell them, if my product is not good enough, that I have to show up everywhere and people buy because they see me. Because you sell, because you, you're a salesperson, because you see me and I'm on your butt, then it's bad marketing. Good marketing is when the product sells itself. Good marketing is when there's a need for this product. When the people see the product and it fits their needs, it makes them satisfied that they want to buy again. And it's not dependent on salespeople. The more salespeople, the more I sell. The less salespeople, the less I sell. Okay? So you can't be an um, utopist. An utopist is someone that just dreams that they're so good that things are going to happen. It doesn't happen. It's, marketing is not just... Uh, uh, about uh, having the best product and it, it sells itself, but it's also making sure that this product is made for a specific person. It can please everyone. And those specific people are increasingly aware that this product is for them. And eventually they change, eventually your competitors copy you and also go after them. And then these people start look, not looking at you anymore. They start looking at the other one and they start shifting. And so you have to constantly keep their eyeballs on you, okay? Now, marketing is also the four Ps. So the four Ps are four P that are necessary. Product, place, price, and promotion. And uh, marketing is about um, uh, creating, um, so the product is what you sell. The price is the price you will sell. Promotion is the message you're gonna use. And um, the, pro the, the promotion is how you're going to communicate about it. Now, can marketing create things? Can marketing make people buy things? Well, yeah, that's the whole point, isn't it? So you think that's, that's the whole point? Well, yeah, because marketing is to get your product out there and you get your product out there for people to buy it. So, I mean, as far as I know, or at least in my opinion, I feel like that's the whole point of marketing, is it not? Well, one shouldn't confuse marketing with advertising. I would say that marketing doesn't create needs and that needs pre-exist markets and marketers. Um, I think marketers just influence wants. So the, the problem is, and let me hear, I think it was you Dylan that mentioned about the um, one should not confuse marketing with advertising. What do you mean? Yes, uh, what I mean by that is I think there's by this idea of marketing, a lot of the, a lot of my classmates, at least when I read on the questions of the community uh, on Packback, is that there is this concern that people are observing this grounded shoe and they're saying, how do we convince people to buy this? And, and I'm reading in the comments also, it's like, oh, well, I wouldn't want to 
wear a rounded shoe. So how am I going to quote unquote market this to somebody when it's like, we're not, the, the key here is that, you know, don't worry about it. It's like, we're not just salespeople. Like that's the whole point of taking this marketing class is to, to help us learn that it isn't just about sales. Marketing is way it's way more than that. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, the lecture is, uh, you know, very clear about it also is, and, and I think that was, you know, our first, our first two weeks of, of attending this, I think, you know, if people still are, if people still have that conception, then it might, you know, they might have trouble later on, you know, for example, marketing Nike, <laughs> when there's plenty of other, uh, there's plenty of other products and brands out there and, 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 uh, and, and quote unquote markets out there. Yeah, so uh, thank you for your, your comments. So uh, that's why it's good that we talk about it right now because we want everyone eventually to see that marketing um, goes above as a very strategic uh, function that consists in understanding that if business is about selling, you already start, start failing. Because once your business is about selling, it's therefore about price. And it's about mar just uh, incentivizing, motivating everyone. And it's not about the focus about the customer, but it's the focus of the business. When you are in a sales position, you don't care what, so much what the person wants. A good, a good salesperson care about what the person wants. So let me rephrase that. If you want to be a good salesperson, you need to care about what the people want in order to make sure that you sell them what they need so that way they come back because they trust you and because that way you can sell different things to the different people knowing that they will be satisfied because you know maybe the product better than them. So there's this element of, of satisfying them. But when you sell, most of the time, you are in a position which is short term. Because you have an inventory that they put on your back. You are paid maybe with no fixed salary, maybe, or a very small fixed salary with a commission. The more you sell, the more you make. You don't really decide what you're going to sell. You just be told, this is what you have. Just go sell it. Move inventory. And there is a meeting every day, every week that talks about how much you sell, sold, how much you should have sold. And therefore it's, it's very pressure and it's not focusing on growing the brand. It, you don't care, you just sell, 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 sell. There's no, it's more short term, it's more revenue based, it's more stressful. Marketing is trying to minimize this, um, uh, simplify this by saying before we get in a bottleneck which consists in saying geez we've got all this crap we gotta have to sell it is you think about who is out there what do they want what are we good at what what should we do for them what can we do for them and that's kind of what's interesting is because you need to take a position as a marketer I'm not saying it's a religion, but more like, you know what? I want to do good. People out, out there, they want something and I'm going to be the one giving it to them. And I want to be the one giving it to them because I care for people and I want them to get the best. And I, I'm here and I'm going to do the best for them. I think I, I'm better for doing the best for them. Not like I'm better because I'm the best. That's arrogance but I'm better at serving people. I'm better at understanding them. And so therefore, it's more um, above sales. And so sales is part of marketing, but it's reactive. And inside marketing, you can be more proactive as well. And so proactive is to understand the needs and therefore make people buy better stuff it's still stuff better things that will serve their needs so you do not create needs you create 
wants. It's just like, right now, what could you be? You could be sleepy. That's a human need. You could be thirsty. That's a human need. You could be ang angry. That's a human need. You could want to go to the toilet. That's a human need. So you have all kinds of human need, which you have, they have, I have, everybody has. But as a marketer, you don't create these, they exist. So what you do is you serve them with new ways to serve them better. You make better and better beverages, or at least better and better perceived beverages. Because that's another thing that is interesting is it's, it has to be perceived. So more important that they perceive it to be better than your product to be the absolute better product. I mean, it's, it's nice to think that you have the absolute better product, but more important that they, that they have, that who you want to sell it to perceive as being better. So you work on want. A marketer serves needs with new want. Okay, so Nike was selling shoes with air, air one, air two, air three, more and more bubbles. And they made people believe that more bubble is better in order to make better shoes. Now, orthopedists have said, you know, the more cushioning, the worst when you run. So the cushioning went down for the people that really run. But the, for the people that run around, they're still buying the very softy shoes, which is bad if you were to run. You, you'll hurt your ligaments if you were to do that. So that trend became more and more, but for the people that don't know about running, and then you have the nostalgia revival that came for fashion. And then you have some innovation now and then that come. And so the, the, um, the earthing um, wire or whatever you call it, is so, a sort of an innovation that sort of, I mean, medically, I mean, would it be FDA approved and all that? That's a different story. Uh, it may be very difficult to show the benefit because it's something that maybe we do not have the science to measure that there is a benefit versus there's less benefit versus there's no benefit. That technology maybe for proving whatever that thing does, does not exist. It is possible that it takes a leap of faith to believe what it does. Um, maybe it's a gadget that sounds good and, and, and therefore it's going to be purchased not because you need it, but because you perceive that you need it. Um, so you have to understand that we in business do not create needs. We create wants for existing needs, needs that are human. So it's like you say, well, I feel like I need my phone. I don't understand what this professor is talking about because I mean, we all need an iPhone now, or some Samsung this or whatever uh, smartphone. Or do you, what you need is you need communication because human beings are that way. They need to communicate. The, um, the, the smartphone is just a, today's want and today's wants are changing. If in 1985, you told people about smartphone, they would have said that only in movies like Star Wars and all of that, right? And um, and if today you were able to see the type of communication device that we'll use in 50 years, if I was able to travel in time and bring it today, you would look at it and you'd say, that's only in Star Wars. When in fact, things constantly change. So knowledge and science constantly change. And therefore we are, things we think to be true are wrong. And things we think to be wrong are true. Science constantly involved. Can you repeat that one more time, discover. Professor? The what? Can you repeat that one more time, please? Yeah, things that we believe to be true today may be wrong, and things that we believe to be wrong may be true because science constantly change, and therefore, you with this new knowledge, you get to have more um, uh, insurance, oh, evidence. Okay on things. Uh, 
you know, I mean, how often have we heard, and it's always very sad, that there was someone that went to jail for having done something for 20 years. And in fact, it was found that this person was not guilty. And then you, you go, how come? And you find, and that's what has happened in the last 20 years, is because of DNA that didn't exist 20 years. They were using fingerprints. So they found this person fingerprint everywhere. Therefore, you're the murderer. Then they had some uh, blood this and blood that and air here and there, which science changed because now we can do DNA with the air and the blood. And then we found now it's not this person's DNA. And then we said, oh, sorry. So because now of science, using the evidence that we kept, this person actually quite for well, now sure I didn't kill this person and went in jail 25 years for no reason. So science change, or what's changed mostly is the technology around science and our understanding, and therefore we, we change. Um, you know, Red Bull, um, if you Google Red Bull and does it work, you will find that Red Bull went into a situation through a group of consumers that uh, attacked Red Bull because they said that Red Bull does not give you the, um, the benefit that Red Bull is saying it's giving you. So they went into a lawsuit. Red Bull was very quick at stopping this lawsuit to go further. And they went to some, what's called arbitration, which is before a lawsuit where you negotiate. And usually the negotiation is very easy. It's how much you need to stop. That's what arbitration is. And then you just negotiate. So the one that needs the money is going to act as if this was a big damage. You know, they drink that Red Bull. They were supposed to go through an exam. This exam was to become um, airline pilot. And, uh, and they are, will never be an airline pilot. And, and now they, they are a Uber driver. And then they multiply the years they could work as an airline pilot that equals to $6 million and they lost $6 million. So my number for me to stop talking is $6 million. And then Red Bull say, okay, here's the check, goodbye. And so they did that, but they were also very smart is because they said, we're gonna pay what these people are asking and what the judge is asking because the judge asked for something as well for the community. And then they made sure that this lawsuit could not be repeated. So don't start tomorrow or today trying to uh, sue uh, Red Bull for the fact that it does nothing. They already got an agreement with the government that nobody can do it again. You can sue them twice for the same thing. Too bad because I, I, need, I need a little bit of cash right now and that was an easy way to get cash, but you need to find another opportunity, which is what you're trying to learn uh, in this class, the concept of opportunity. So Red Bull was creating a want and serving a need, which is need for drinking, need for uh, energy, you know? So you could, you could just take water and a sugar cube and that's gonna do the same, the same thing, right? Or you could take a coffee, strong coffee, you know, like a Turkish coffee or something. And that's gonna do the same thing. So then you can say, oh, the Turkish coffee doesn't do it for me, but you could take some vitamin C or whatever I mean, don't take my word for it. I'm not a physician. I'm just making guesses on what will give you energy. But what I'm saying, that's important that you understand that you are in this boat where you can determine what's the future and you want to put yourself in a position that you care for people and you want to do something that is positive to them. So in that situation, is you have found this, the big leading opportunity, which is earthing and the implementation of earthing through the ground it shoes. And then you're thinking, <clears throat> who, who would benefit the most from this? What does this earthing ground that should do? What's the primary target? What's the people that should, who should be buying this first? Because it serves their needs first. And then you can deploy that into a want. Let's say, let's say that I'm making it up, but let's say that the ground that shoes help you when you have, um, uh, I don't know, like you, you go pee more than average. Let's say someone pees five days a week. And if you were wearing gaunted shoes, you only pee, uh, you pee five days a week. And the people that pee more than five days a week, you'll go perfect. I'll sell it to them because that's one of the benefits. 
But then you will find that, that that's a specific group. It's mostly men, not women that have this issue. Mostly men from this age to that age. Mostly men that, uh, I don't know, that wear tight boxers, or I don't know what it is. And so that becomes all kinds of elements of opportunity that you can use in order to find who would want it the most because of some innate uh, human needs. Uh, I don't expect everybody understood everything I, ex I explained because it's incremental. So some got it the first week, the second week, the third week, the first week. Eventually, my objective is that after maybe a month, everybody starts getting the, the essence of what marketing is trying to do. You definitely get people in a position where they feel like they need things, but you put very much build that want. So a need is something that is innate. So it's the essential needs that we have as human. The want is this you know, cultural, societal form that we are uh, using in order to satisfy a need. And then the demand is the capacity for, uh, for someone to actually be able to achieve their, uh, their needs and wants. So what's the target market? The target market is the specific group of customers that you will focus on. The, um, so now everybody can be a target is you have to really select who you want to be the final target. Now I want to discuss about the concept of strategy. So the project requires you to plan and therefore you're going to have to think in terms of strategy. Why do we have to plan is because we want to make sure that we set some objectives, that we set the resources in order to reach these objectives, and also that we monitor the success of our plans. If we don't do that, time slips away. One thing that, it, that I didn't have time to say, but when you actually do a, a, a strategic plan, so when you buy yourself, it's not totally the same because you're doing it for yourself in order to have um, some kind of guideline that you can follow. But when you do it that you have other people, it's also very important that you do that because sometimes when you talk to people, you think you're on the same page. But once you start writing things down, that's why you start seeing gaps in what people think that should be done. So writing it down is helpful for everyone to come up to an agreement. So maybe it's a little bit more work because you don't always all agree exactly on the same thing. But once it's written down, it is very difficult for someone to go back and say, oh, I, I, that's not how I was seeing things. And then you say, how did you see things? And then you get into a discussion. When you write it inside the plan and everybody agrees to that plan and then it gets sort of copied or printed or emailed as a PDF, everybody has the PDF and everybody knows what everyone has agreed. So. When you're in, in business, even though you're in business with your, your best friend, your wife, your parents, it's always good to get things written down because it's easier for everyone to agree or disagree and therefore have some kind of material document that you can go back. So that's another reason that seems very small, but once you've done it for real, you see it's not a small, that could be the main reason why you would want to do it, is everybody on the same page. But the reason is obviously that you see that what you're saying is as some logic. The uh, process of writing this, uh, this plan is, um, it's not like you're, like you're writing a book where you have the first page and the last page, you have an introduction and a conclusion. In uh, a marketing plan, there is no such a thing as introduction and conclusion. There is an a summary which is usually called an executive summary. And where do you start? Should you start with the number one, writing your mission, the number two, and then three? Is it's, uh, there's not a rule that says that you have to start writing the first one and the second and so forth. It's sort of annoying to explain because it's called iterative. So iterative means that you can sort of start everywhere. You can start from the last piece and then go backwards. So you can start 
from uh, any of those uh, boxes, but at the end, you need to complete all of them. So in your situation, you are writing a proposal, and I hope you um, were curious enough to go to the, see some of the samples. You would see these samples were not written from the first page to the, to the last page, page 10. They were wrote, written where students may have written, started writing somewhere in the middle and then build up in every, every one of the section. It's iterative because once you start writing the plan, then that gives you maybe the idea of what the objective should be. Once you've wrote the objective on the plan, then you are more clear about what should be the strategies. Then you write the implementation. And once you write the implementation, you realize that you need to change some of the information in your strategies. You change some of the information in your strategies, and now you're going to change the objectives. So it's iterative because it takes a lot of rounds in different orders in order to complete it. Now, you will perfectly understand that when you will write your proposal. Um, it's more often that people start with the strengths and weaknesses because that's easier. The opportunities are the hardest section and it takes several weeks to write good opportunities. Doesn't happen in, at one time. When we look at the table of content of a marketing plan, it looks pretty much like this. You don't have to write all of this down because it's inside the PDF that you can download. It's gonna be also in the video that will uh, give you the link. And it shows, uh, so just to point at the important section, it shows the, uh, the current marketing situation. So that's what's called the SWOT analysis. The issue analysis is going to think about um, what could be the potential strategies that you will follow and evaluate those strategies. So it's like, we recommend four potential strategies, potential. Of these four strategies, the first one is X, Y, Z. The plus is about it, advantage about it, it's here's a list. The minus is the disadvantage about it, here's the list. And then you go to the second strat potential strategy, the third, the fourth, and, and then you have a recommendation which consists in recommending which one of those four are the best one. And then you say it again, why do you think this is the best one? This method, this intellectual process that you use in order to um, make recommendation are very basic in, in business, where in business you don't, when you make a recommendation, you don't have just one. You come up with several. You discuss the several opportunities, the several strategies, the several tactics, the several things, and then you analyze the pros and cons for each one of them, and then you come up with a recommendation for what's better. That's sort of the constant intellectual way to go about when making a recommendation in any situation in business. Then follows the objectives, so the high-level objectives. Uh, these are objectives. Um, the best objectives are the ones that are measurable. So that's the first nature of a good objective. So if you say, we want to increase the sales by 20%, so that's measurable. So you take the two-day sales plus 20%. And then they need to have a timeline. So what, how much, and when. So what, increase the sales, how much, by 20%, when, in 12 months. We want to, inc we want to increase the, or decrease the number of phone calls complaining about our services. What, by how much by 10% by when in the next 12 months. So objective, just you have to remember that, is they need to have what, how much, and when. If you're missing one of these, you don't have the what, then it's not clear what, what usually the what, nobody forgets that. But what people forget is the how much, and oftentimes they forget by the when. A, bis, uh, a marketing plan is usually 12 months, it can be more than 12 months, but it's usually 12 months. Then this is followed by the, by the definition of the strategies. So in the issue analysis, you discuss the potential strategies. In the marketing strategies, you go up again, repeating what is your strategies and explaining who it is for. So that's STP. STP is gonna be one class 
in like two weeks. I will just discuss what is STP. STP is segmentation, targeting, and positioning. And um, uh, it's, it's the concept that consists in dividing consumers, that's segmenting, and then targeting, which is grouping them based on some characteristics. And then positioning is what would be the meaning of what we're selling, what does it mean, what's the reputation? It's very connected to the brand. Um, then this is followed. So the number five marketing strategies is uh, it's a repetition for when it comes to discussing what's the strategies, but uh, discussing a who it is for that's new. Uh, it can be long, it can be short. Um, usually there's a lot of research involved in discussing the strategy, the segmentation, targeting, and positioning, because you don't guess or make uh, the best. Uh, guess in order to define who they are is do have to collect data in order to really pinpoint who they're going to be. And then the number of uh, six year action programs are what's called the uh, implementation of your four P's. So it's defining what you're going to do in terms of the product, the price, the promotion, and the place. The word place is, is sort of uh, throwing off pe most people because we don't understand what that means, place. Um, the four P's were created to make marketing simple. So that it's been used since the 50s and it's still used today, but it's sort of over simple, simple in the sense that, for example, the word place, people think it's about where do you put it in the, on the shelf or in the store or whatever, when in fact place is about distribution. So it should be the three P on the one D, but then people will forget it, you know, product, price, promotion, and distribution, 3P on 1D, but just to make it easier, they call it the four Ps. You just have to remember that the P of place has nothing to do with uh, merchandising, where merchandising is about the location in the store. In this situation, it has to do with distribution and logistics. And then finally, controls. It's the process that you're gonna use in order to measure the effectiveness of your plans. So um, going back, we say, all right, so we have to find something good for someone that would take advantage of the opportunity of the ground they choose. Yes, so they are competitors. They are changing the environment. Who would benefit the most from that? Well, when we look at the environment, we, uh, we find that there are characteristics in the environment that are gonna be in favor of this. Maybe, the fact that there is changes in prices, changes of regulation, changes of consumer behavior, that's gonna have an impact on the strategy that we're gonna choose. So here again, you go and look at the environment and all the characteristics. You create your situation analysis, focusing on the SWOT. And then here's an example, crack shoes. What was the opportunity? So the opportunity is never what you're going to do. So the opportunity is not to make a rubber shoe. That's the strategy, making a new shoe made of rubber strategy. What would be the opportunity for Crocs? They're comfortable. They're comfortable, exactly. So that's a strength. So how would you, so if you say Crocs shoes are comfortable according to, 1 million consumer rating it as five, four out of five in comfort, of comfort. That's a strength. How would you turn this into an opportunity? So you say, according to shoes.com research from August, 2021, Comfort is one of the top five characteristics uh, people use when buying shoes. And then you'll say, we're gonna make Crocs super comfortable because we'll be using rubber. Okay. So the comfort is not what you're gonna do. The comfort is an outcome of people. So say people say um, purple, is 
that is a woman of all any age, favorite color of shoes, according to shoes.com uh, research of 2 million people in August 2021. What would you do? You start making purple shoes if that's the suddenly is the favorite color. So opportunities are the driver of change. Obviously, you see there's no purple shoe. But, so what are the characteristics of Crux besides comfort? Why was Crux created? What was the opportunity? Waterproof. Waterproof, that's correct. Waterproof, yes, that was one of the characteristics of the shoe. So therefore, how, what would be the, the opportunity? How would you state it? Um, maybe the opportunity is those who like to garden. They're easy to slip on and go out to the garden without having to worry about anything getting messy. Okay. So then you, so you, they, how would you state that as an opportunity? I guess you would have to show that popularity and hobbies like those are increasing. So you have to say, according to shoes.com, research from August 2021, uh, pe the people who garden, you know, like 95% of the people who garden prefer uh, sleep on shoes, which are anti sleeping, slippage or whatever, anti-skid. And gardening is becoming one of the top five hobby, favorite hobbies of women over 55 years old. You see how I build up the opportunity? It's based on research. It's not me emotionally. It's totally data driven. So you're right. So that's one. No, I, I tell you one of the characteristics of Crux, it's uh, your feet don't smell as much as other shoes. So what was the opportunity? Less smelly feet. That's the strength. Lots of people complain about the smell of their shoes after long hours of use. Exactly. Or also, maybe a lot of people complaining about athlete's foot. Exactly. Yeah. So you see now you're starting to get it. Okay, perfect. So you don't say we make crook shoes because people feet smell. No. You say, according to shoes.com, in 2021, six people out of 10 uh, say that one of their pet peeve is to have smelly feet. Pet peeve is to have smelly feet. And then you say, oh, let's make sure that don't smell as much or ever. So you're basically telling people what, like, no, you're telling them what they need, right? No, you find, or you find a problem they have. I have smelly feet. I keep falling. Okay. I don't have time to put shoes. You show them where the problem is and then you give them a solution basically. Yeah, you well, you, they show, they, they tell their problems and then you're there and you stay. I'm a business person. My job is solving problems. Give it to me. Oh, you've got smelly feet? Mm, let me see. I think I have a solution, right? It's like the other day I saw this video of a doctor that said, so I'm not gonna give my opinion saying vaccine are safe or vaccine are unsafe. I'm not a doctor, I don't know. However, I saw this video of this doctor who is already working on making medicine for some disease that he says is, are gonna come from uh, having the vaccine. So it's like you have like, you have like the disease, someone makes the vaccine, the vaccine is going to do disease and you have another doctor that makes a, a, a remedy to the disease of the vaccine. That's marketing. 
Marketing is to be one step ahead. So you go, hmm, what's the problem? People's feet smell. Okay, I'll make it no smell shoes. Shoes sleep. Oh, like one person worries about sleeping shoes. Do the marketer worry? No. More and more people worry about shoes sleeping. Then they worry about. You're there to solve problems. You're there to make a product that would solve problems. So if you go and watch a program called Shark Tank, you listen to the first three minutes. The first three minutes of a Shark Tank program is to explain what's the opportunity. This person comes and say, people have a hard time hearing their phone ring. According to a research, this many millions of people can't hear their phone when it rings. Therefore, I've created Ring Master. I'm just making it up. Right? If people hear their phone, don't do anything. You're not going to invent something that people are not complaining about or wish they had. So you only create things for things that people are saying that they wish they had. You only create things in anticipation of a problem. And you want to be the first one to create a remedy, a solution to a problem you want that, that you know is going to come and that people don't know. But when it comes, they go, quick, quick, what's the solution? And then you come and say, I've got the solution. Don't worry about it. Oh, who are you? Crux. Oh, perfect. Okay, here's another example from a project that did with students. So these students created this. This is an invention that was a few years ago. And they, they created that company, the name and all that, called Vinylist. So Vinylist, the opportunity is that people want to buy more and more, according to uh, rollingstones.com, want to buy more and more vinyl discs. They're listening to vinyl discs. And the number is plus 22% a year or whatever. And so this student said, therefore, we're going to create a vinyl disc, but which is going to be made, custom made for customers. So it's like you go online, vinylist.com, and you say the artist that you want, and then they'll make the vinyl disc for you. However, that's too expensive. So what they do is they use the technology of peer-to-peer, -peer, an application, peer-to-peer, -peer, where people can pledge. That exists. This is not like a Star Trek. It exists. And people pledge for this and pledge for that. They pledge for um, um, you know, investing in things and all this. So they pledge for a list of artists to be inside a vinyl. It does not exist. But they go, oh, I love this one, that one. You can pledge for eight, eight artists that can be in a vinyl. And everybody pledge and everybody votes for the other selection from everyone else. And once one selection gets more than 35, I forgot the number, but it's a 5,000 people that say, oh, that selection, if it existed, I would buy it. And if it ever comes out, here's my credit card. If it comes out, I want to be in the 5,000 that are going to get it. So you put your credit card. They don't take any money. You pledge. If there's 5,000, the day there's 5,000, they produce it. You get it in the mail. So what are the opportunities? People are buying more and more vinyl discs. It's in the business. People are pledging, joining apps, downloading apps, doing peer-to-peer, -peer, using this technology. Bingo. You found the opportunity to sustain this business. OK? Do you have any questions? So I'll use more example. But here, what does the business need the most? Money? market research, help, time, a solid business plan. Money, market research, help, time, a solid business plan. Solid business plan. Correct. They need the most is a solid business plan. In fact, if you have a business plan and a good one, you would have market research inside. Most people say, oh, I, I love to have my own business, but I can't do it. Why? I don't have time. I don't know how to do it. I don't have money. 
the people that think that way will never succeed because they only see problems. They don't see solutions. When you're in business, you have to be a solution maker. It reminds me of this. Um, I had a, a student assistant one time and this person was pretty good. And um, I went into a conference and I ran into someone that is pretty famous. That is the CEO of a um, social media marketing firm. And he said, hey, Frank, if you see a good student, tell me. And I said, okay, I keep my eyes up. And then I went back to working outside of the conference. And then my student assistant said, oh, I'm helping you with all this. And I want to tell you in six months, I have to stop being your student assistant. And if you see a good job, let me know. And then I go, wow, just this morning, this famous person from this famous uh, firm asked me if I knew someone, I'm going to put you in touch. And then this, the student was very excited, want to form all this. And I put in touch, I made the introduction through email. And then this famous marketer, social media consultant asked my students in the email, I was just CC, please send me a portfolio of things that you've done in the past for me to see what kind of project you worked on. And then one day went by two, three, four, five days. And then this uh, famous social media person came to me and said, sorry, I didn't hear back from your student. This person never sent me a response to my email. So then I was like, oh, that's strange. Then I run into the person and I say, hey, did you respond to this famous person? And then you, you know what the students told me? The student told me, I don't have time to make a list of the project that I work, worked on to email this person. I don't have time. But I would be delighted if you could give me a, a reference with a really good job. Problem is business doesn't work that way. In business, you have to always work above and beyond. So if someone very important offers you a very good job, whatever they ask, if you really want, if you're ambitious and you want a good job and you want to get promoted, promoted fast, is whatever they ask, you say yes, and you get it done as up the same day. You look professional, and that's why you want to do some great projects because you want to be able to talk to potential employers about your great projects. Like for example, you're doing a project on this uh, innovation, which is called Grande Shoes. If someone asks you, have you worked on a great project? You want to be able to say, I worked on the Grande Shoes. I was trying to do X, Y, and Z. This was some of the problem I was having. And then I figured out X, this solution. And, and you want to talk about problems, but you don't want to just talk about problems. Nobody wants to hire anyone who all they talk about is problems there's nothing wrong about talking about problems if you're in business is if you follow in the next sentences with the word solutions business people hire people successful people they have a lot of problems but they they know it it comes with the territory of success and they love taking care of problems because that's how you get ahead. So needing help, well, there's always some help. The time is always too, too short, but that's what you do is you write a business plan. Now, when you ask people about business plan, 99% of the people don't know what's a business plan. So I would say you take a graduating student and you ask her or him, what's a business plan? They have no idea. These people got four years in a business school. They don't know what's the business plan. That's pretty bad. Anyone knows what's the business plan? The plan a company or entity makes to execute or sell a product. Basically, a, uh, I guess a, a, a written doc that states um, the future of the, of the company or the potential future of the company. Okay. 
Thank you for, I, I was a little obnoxious in my introduction to this question, but what happens is more important that you know what it is and that you think about what it is. Because can you imagine, it would be like someone that went to medical school and he doesn't know what's a heart rate. It's like, are you an MD? I'm an MD. You know what's an heart rate? An heart rate has to do with the heart. Some kind of thing that's to do with the speed of the heart. I mean, would you want to take that doctor as your personal doctor? No. Now you're a business student, you need to know what's the business plan. And a business plan in itself does not exist. So it was good that you say it's a written document. It's always better because that it's like the marketing plan. It's a written document. Business plan does not exist because it's a combination of existing plan. You do a business plan because there's a lot of things to organize. There's a lot of confusion of all the things that in what order are they going to work? And therefore you want to timeline everything you want to use all the functions that you have in the business so does an accounting plan exist yes does a marketing plan exist yes does a legal plan exist yes so the legal plan is done by the people that know about business law and all the legal aspects that exist the um, hr plan exists the accounting like i said so all of these exist. So business plan is the fancy name for the combination of plan of the various function inside a company. Most people, when they say, hey, what's your business plan? My business plan is to buy in China and sell in America. Oh, that's your business plan? Yeah, that's my business plan. Why would you buy in China and sell in America? Because I buy cheap in China, and I sell it expensive in America. That's my business plan. Buy, buy low, sell high. Oh, that's not a business plan. That's, um, that's your pricing model, maybe. It's, it's your pricing strategy, or your, at least your purchasing strategy, but it's not your business plan. So your business plan is, is more complex. A business plan is all the plans. So you go to the business school, you learn about accounting, you do an accounting plan. Law, you do a legal plan. And so a business plan will be a document where you could say there's one page for each one of the function of the majors. There's multiple majors at the College of Business. Each page is a different major and you review these conditions. So if you are General Electric, you don't do one page for each function is you do 50 page for each function. If you're a single owner, you do one paragraph for each function, at least. Most single owners don't even know what's a business plan. They, the most single own business, these people think it's a waste of time to do a business plan because they are just a small business. Why would a small business like me, you know, who only make $50,000 a year, will do a business plan? Why? Because don't you want to do better? Don't you want to anticipate? Don't you want to grow? Don't you want to have employees that you want to share your plan? Don't you want to have partners? Don't you want to have investors? You know, if you are a single owner business and you want to stay single owner and you don't want to grow, I suppose then it makes sense not to have a business plan. But if you, have, you want to grow a little bit, you want to have a business plan because you want to prepare you want to anticipate, right? So most a business owner, unfortunately, what they do is they wing things. They go day to day and they focus on sales. And therefore, because they focus on sales, they're always one step behind. So if they were focusing on marketing, they would anticipate better. A great challenge of life is knowing enough to think you're right, but not know enough to know that you're wrong. So this is from a very smart person called Neil deGrasse Tyson. If you go on the Google again, you find who he is. He's a very uh, intelligent, knowledgeable person. And that's the problem. It's when people think they know, and they, the little they know makes them an expert. You know? 
And unfortunately, the intelligence is knowing that you, you don't know, but you know where to find the answer. And so that's why I try also to teach in this class is, do you know it all? No. Do I know it all? I, for sure I don't. But, it, but I know that I don't, and I know I, where to find the answer. So your value is the value of your offer that is perceived by your ca target customers. It's not worth to try to please everyone. You can't please everyone. Therefore, you need to select who you want to please. Who do I want to sell this product? Who I want to sell my services? Who do I want to sell the grounded shoes innovation? Do I want to sell it to everybody? No, you'll be failing if you start to sell it to everybody. There's a group of people that you think will like it better and faster and for less money and with a better margin for you. That's what you want. You want to please the people that are going to be appreciating the most. So, Bob. Bob is single bachelor. He's driving a motorcycle. I guess that's okay. No, he's getting married. Well, how long is his wife going to like to be in the back seat? Not very long, depending on the bike. I mean, this bike, not very long. No, th they have a baby. What's happening? The motorcycle is for sale, but they already even bought a car. Now they have a second key, a third key. So people change and people perspective change. Therefore, there's not such a thing as a perfect or true perspective. It's evolved. You see all this breakfast cereal here? Are they good? They're not good for me, but they're good for someone. And that's correct. These cereals are great. These cereals are fantastic as long as they satisfy the need of someone with a want that speak to this someone. If they are just pretty boxes that everybody think it's pretty, but nobody buys, there's no point. So it has to be serving someone needs. Here's an example. You have this product, pick one. It's a um, blender. Which one do you pick? Do you pick the 1999 or do you pick the 6999? Which one is better? It depends. It depends. Quite possibly the one that's more expensive, right? But it all depends on the person. It depends on the person. There will be someone saying, for sure, the more expensive one, because you get what you pay for. Versus another one say, hey, you, you're wrong. They both exactly look the same. I would rather take the deal of the 1999. And there will be some people, they always take the cheaper, some people the most expensive. And there's some people, they would say, you know what? What's on the right is better than on the left. Oh, it seems to me that the one on the right has a bigger top, a smaller handle, but a bigger top. So it's perception. Perception is very important. So there's no right, there's no wrong. It depends. If your customer think the best one is the 1999, you will fail with that customer by selling the 69.99. And then you will wonder, why is my business bankrupt? Because you sold the wrong product to the right, wrong people. There's all kinds of people, there's all kinds of product. There's room for everyone. Just make sure that you match. The reality of the game is you need to be set. How do you, how are you set? How do you match? It's in the perception. So this is a, maybe a little bit of a dummy example, but I want, I try my best to make all kinds of different examples for everyone to get it. So there's a, a four cylinder age engine and it's between 10 and $34,000. The six cylinder engine is between 28 and $59,000. And the eight cylinder engine is between 44 and $100,000. So the smart person is the one that buys the cheapest of the kind. So you buy uh, a six cylinder at $28,000, you'd be better off than the one that buy the four cylinder at 34. I mean, that's what someone may think. But then you're in business and you say, you know what, let me play this as a game. What could I do to gain the most out of? And remember people buy with their perception. So what you do then is you, buy, you sell a product that you call not V4, V8, or V6, because they know what's the bracket and what to expect, is you're gonna call it the Grandmaster Turbo Super Excel 
master, master, super great, great, eight. Why would you do that? You do that because people will see the number eight. So they figure it's eight cylinder. You didn't say that, you know, liar. You just use their perception. You call it grandmaster because there's a lot of people, they, they don't say it, but they wish they were a grandmaster. And so that sounds good. And then you put the word turbo because they figure out the other one, that one has more. The other one is just V4, V8, V6. That one has a turbo. And then the people, they go uh, along, away, happy, thinking they got the best deal. But they, they didn't get it. They don't know. People are not experts. People jump to conclusion. People like things that make them feel that they know what they, they, they're talking about. So that's, that would be one way. Is this a little deceiving? Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not telling you to, to do this all the time. I mean, I'm not this, <laughs> this scamming professor that teach you scam marketing, but I want you to understand that you have to be aware of this. Perception is extremely important. Your perception may be that what you do is the best thing and your perception may be closer to the truth. But if the customers don't see that and they see the opposite because their point of reference is different than your point of reference, you will fail not because you, because you don't have a great product. In fact, you had a better product than they deserved but they didn't see it because you didn't speak their language, okay? This artist sold invisible sculpture for more than $18,000. This was last June. An Italian artist sold an invisible sculpture for $18,000. And the buyer was got a certificate of authenticity to prove it was real and that person who bought it was extremely satisfied in fact don't tell anyone but i bought it here it is here i've got the the sculpture i tell you what it's very beautiful look and in fact you know why i bought it because i'm going to sell it to someone else for fifty thousand dollars i think this person would be very happy with that invisible sculpture so nice you know the benefit benefit is it's light you can travel with it. Every time you go somewhere, you can bring it with you. It's always there. It follows you everywhere. Um, not everybody yeah, see the beauty see of that it. sculpture, but it's there. What? You know, was it another a bomber or someone? No, all right. So. So yeah, the invisible sculpture. I mean, I didn't make this up. This is a true story. So um, I had a question. Like sometimes yeah. people buy high-end art though, just for like tax write-offs. So like, is it really marketing at that point? Oh, well, but that's a, that's an abnormality, you know? Because did the guy buy the piece because he actually liked the fact that it was invisible or like what was his intentions in purchasing that piece? His intention purchasing that piece is to get the certificate and probably to sell it to someone else. Oh, okay, so it still has value because it's one of one. Yeah. It's still, yeah, it's one of one invisible sculpture. And this sculpture since has made other invisible sculptures. And so people are buying his invisible sculpture. Mm -hmm. What's the opportunity? The opportunity is these people, they will see that there is, if, if he sold an invisible sculpture for $100, it would not have worked. But an invisible sculpture for $18,000 is great. And it's certified because then you can sell it to someone else. And then you have all kinds of people that want to get invisible sculpture from this artist because then it becomes worth something. Mm -hmm. And so you see a lot of this in art. I remember seeing a movie with a comedian and um, 
he this comedian was a was a painter and um he was speaking with an accent and he, he didn't have the accent that's why also what it was funny is he figured out that if you had an accent you could sell your paintings more expensive so he took an accent and i mean uh, for me it's easy to uh, do an accent like a french accent for a painting probably would work and say look at my beautiful painting it's so beautiful and then he turned and he had a white canvas behind him so he hadn't done the painting yet and he was just saying you should buy it and then he turned he sees nothing he grabs a marker and he goes on the painting like this and then he turns and says you see it's so beautiful it's so beautiful and it's really a good price hundred and twenty five thousand dollars and then he looks at the camera and he goes oh that's not going to sell and he just added one one million one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars and and so you you have to think about who you're selling it to if you sell this invisible painting for a hundred dollars you won't sell it for eighteen thousand dollars you're going to sell it because someone is going to buy it in order to try to sell it to somebody else and and make some money and so that's what happens sometimes to some artists they started they were poor they ended they were extremely wealthy how because they figure it out and some started very poor and they ended very poor why because they didn't figure it out so it's important when you when you sell something when you make something that you define who is my customer and what am i selling to them um, again your job is to do a SWOT analysis strengths weaknesses I mean, don't worry about it because you don't know the brand. Focus on the opportunities. What are the changes in the environment that you can take advantage of? What are the threats that are going to make it difficult? What are the problems that you want to solve, essentially? List the problem you want to solve. People are stressed. People are consuming more and more uh, natural medicine. People are more anxious. People are uh, trusting uh, more and more um things that cannot be proven people um are looking at videos people i don't all of these different things that happen more and more these are the opportunities and there's more to discover and the one that you discover will help you make your story opportunities are conditions outside that you can take advantage of threats are conditions outside meaning in your environment that will be making your strength or go against the what your business is trying to do and it will, therefore will make you weaker there is a, a document that i've created that is called an oist so the oist um, is the opportunity ideas strategy and tactics so that's all you have to think about the problem is when we, you, I, everyone, conceptualize a business, we all always think in terms of uh, IDs. What are the IDs? IDs are not very good because IDs are not clear if they are opportunities, if they are tactics, if they are strategies, if they are objectives. You know, the ID is to sell a shoe which will be made of leather and also of wood for women that worry about their health. That's an idea. What's the opportunity? So constantly the opportunity is the only evidence that you can trust. What is epistemology? Epistemology is therefore the philosophy that thinks about knowledge and how, what we know and what we don't know. The truth, the knowledge, the belief. So the knowledge is what we know, what we gather. And from this knowledge, we make decisions. So you have to identify knowledge and knowledge constantly change. So you have to identify what people think. Cultural trends. Here's something that happened recently this summer. Known carcinogens, so cancer, found in some popular sunscreen, a test show. 74 brands of sunscreen were removed from the shelf this summer because the government found that they will give you skin cancer. So that sort of defeats the purpose. Why do you put sunscreen? You know who invented sunscreen? The inventor of sunscreen was a Frenchman. He was 
he, he was the founder of the biggest beauty company in the world called L'Oreal. So he invented L'Oreal because he, was, he had some kind of gift, a business gift, in order to work in this industry. That was uh, at the, um, just right after World War I. And he became very wealthy. What do you do when you become well, very wealthy? I mean, back then, even more, it was more obvious than now, but still no. What do you do when you become very wealthy? You go on vacation. So he, he went on vacation. Obviously, 100 years ago, it was not as common as now. And he went on vacation on his yacht. And he was a very fair-skinned uh, man. And he got sunburned. And because his business was creams and, and, um, and perfumes and things like that, he said, hey, why don't I make a sunscreen? So he made a sunscreen for himself and then for his family and then for his friends. He was not into making sunscreen to sell. And then he went like, oh, my, people like my sunscreen. What was the opportunity that made his business grow from the production of sunscreen? People were getting their skin burned from the sun. Okay, so that's one. The sun, people burn, the sun burns people's skin. But why he anticipated that he was going to become a billionaire from that? The sun isn't going anywhere. The what? Skin cancer. Uh, skin cancer came much later. He became a billionaire very fast. Because there was a want to there protect a, your skin? Uh, they, not really. Maybe because uh, people started to go on vacation more and more. Exactly. The sun is all, over, is all over the world, Professor. It's something that is going anywhere. Yeah, that's right. So the sun is all over the world. But look, the sun is all over the world. And if you stay in the sun, you get cancer in uh, 1722. The why he became a billionaire in the 20s is because that's when people started having union and union started negotiating that people earn the rights they had rights and the rights to go on vacation. And where people go on vacation, they went to the beach more and more. Uh, if you go back uh, 100 years ago, it was not a, as, a, as a number one destination on the beach. People went on vacation in Pasadena 100 years ago. Now they go on vacation in Santa Monica. So he anticipated that people were going to go more on the beach he anticipated that people were going to remove their clothes. I know now you go to the beach and people have less and less clothes every year, but, he, but people were wearing clothes back then. So he anticipated that people clothes were going to go away, that they were going to go on the beach and they were going to get sunburned. And then he had the product and he was like a hunter waiting for them to show up and say, oh my God, look at my back. Oh, you got a sunburn. Oh, don't worry about it. I've got what, what you need. Here it is, 50 bucks. And then went, what, 50 bucks? Yeah, but you don't want to get that. And then he went, ah, oh, give it to me. And so that's what business is about, is anticipation. But you don't anticipate because you have a crystal ball and you look at your crystal ball and you go, ah, oh, please, um, crystal ball, uh, God, uh, tell me uh, what's the future. That's, that doesn't happen. What it is, is you have to have this, data that tells you hmm, the sun are they going to be more people being burned in the next five years 10 years 20 years and so yeah because they take vacation and they go to the beach they don't know but they're going to get burned but they don't know i know i know before them i have the product before they're going to get hurt when they get hurt they come see me and so he was the first one to do that no This person says, my first marketing job was to impersonate other people, write fake news and fake reviews to hype up my clients. Oa Butler, that's his um, username, created an imaginary London restaurant, the shed at Dawwich. Doesn't exist. Remember the um, invisible scouting? Doesn't exist. So this was a restaurant that didn't exist, which he su successfully got verified on TripAdvisor after providing a phone an address and a website. So he made a, a, a fake website. 
it became on TripAdvisor the number one London restaurant, the, the, the number one uh, star rated restaurant in London. Doesn't exist. How? Well, this person was smart. This person understood how to manipulate information, how to create perceptions that things are true, right? So, and this was not too long ago. Um, uh, you can Google it, NPR, New York Post, and uh, there's been a lot of people talking about it. So it's very important that you become very aware of, of information and use information in order to make decisions. Obviously, some people make decisions to cheat, but there's some people that make commercial decisions in anticipation of what people are gonna do. Knowledge is therefore a perspective. What do you know? Can I change what you know? A lot of work to change someone's no. What people believe is it's much easier to play with it than try to change their belief. What is a perspective, right? So you, uh, you act with that. So marketing is the delivery of customer satisfaction. Let's look at one last example before we uh, break out today. This company, Union Wine. Union Wine was a company that was just another wine maker. How many bottles, how many dollars did they sell a month? A few thousand dollars. What was wrong? They had a great bottle. They had a great label. They had a great wine. How come they only sell a thousand dollars a month? Because they just look like the same as everyone else. So how could they sell more? They should put it on Instagram. Everybody does that. That doesn't help. They should get a celebrity to endorse their product. Yeah, but that's millions of dollars. They don't have that kind of money. So what, what can they do? I don't know. They did a big event. And when they, two days before the big event, the uh, owner of the location for the event says, sorry, you cannot bring glass bottle at the event. I'm not insured for that. It's illegal. And then say, what are we going to do? So they knew someone that could put the wine inside aluminum cans, like, like a soda can. So they went, oh, it's horrible. We're going to have to put our wine in cans. It's horrible, all this. People came at the event and they absolutely loved their cans wine. And then they started selling that because people loved it. And they turned in a matter of weeks into a multi-million dollar business. They became the most sold wine every month in supermarkets because people used this new format for all their benefits. Of course, you don't gonna take this kind of wine when you're trying to do a, a wine gourmet tasting. But this kind of wine is very practical. If you're traveling, if you're going to a picnic, if you are camping and all of these different things, when you want to avoid the large bottle and the glass bottle. And it's convenient and it's trendy and it's something different. So professor, are you telling us that the only way to succeed in business is to get unlucky with something and that turns to be your luck? No, you don't want to think luck is, is in your favor. What you want, is you want to say, you know what? I'm in the wine business, what should I do? Did you do a business plan? A what? A business plan. What is that? Well, it's a, some research that look at your accounting, your finance, your budgeting, your production, your HR, your marketing, your low legal aspects, and try to plan and how this is gonna work for the next year, the next two, three years in order to grow your business. Oh, no, 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 I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. I just wait for luck. Luck, I think I'm a lucky person, so luck is gonna come and sort me out and make me do the right thing. No, 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 that doesn't happen. Oh, it happens, it's so rare. Luck is preparation. The more you prepare, the more you work out some plan and you write it down, the more you can anticipate changes and get lucky. So what you do here this semester is what I'm trying to, to pin and sort of scream loud and clear is that you need to do research in order to identify these opportunities. Where do you do research? You know, I can't do the entire class I'm gonna teach you this semester in just a few sessions, but you're gonna to have to do research by just asking people questions. That's gonna be the next class, talking about research and all this. You're gonna to have to ask questions which consist in asking someone, one person a question, you know, it's like, Hey, do you, what shoe did you buy last? What shoe are you going to buy next? What do you find exciting about the shoe that you have? Um, 
you know, what clothes do you buy? Where do you live? What are your hobbies? Just go into people's mind and try to find things that they care for. Then you can go online, follow some blogs, read some blogs, read the comments. It's just going to do mining, mining for information, mining for some changes, mining for things that are going to inspire you. And then you're going to find those subjects that inspire you and then focus on this specific subject. 